thanks everyone for coming. Um, and thank you, Sanjo, for inviting me. Um, uh, it's a strange experience to speak to the home, home, home crowd. Um, I actually have given a couple talks on this book and uh, uh, previously, and they were much more kind of, they were sort of formal, in-depth lectures about particular elements in the book. Um, but because those are all online, I decided to do something a little more, maybe slightly informal, but um, sort of more personal about the, the sort of process that I went through in writing this book. Um, since I know all of you, and, pro and actually probably all, well, certainly the people in my seminars have heard this stuff a million times. And uh, a lot of this is material and ideas that, um, that I've been talking about for pretty much 20 years. Um, and uh, I hope this is the last time you'll ever have to hear me <laughs> talk about this. Um, so... Uh, this is the book. Um, the, so the book, when I say 20 years, um, it's because this all started after I finished my PhD and I went to London to uh, the British Library where I was hired um, basically by the International Dun Huang Project. They had uh, gotten a three-year grant to digitize the tantric Tibetan manuscripts in the Stein Collection. <coughs> Um, just a quick word on the Dunhuang manuscripts. They were found about a little over uh, something over a hundred years ago um, in a cave on the Silk Road and uh, outside the city of Dunhuang. And uh, it sort of is the mother load for uh, Chinese and Tibetan religious studies um, and so represents some of the earliest materials we have in Tibetan. So. Uh, I was brought in as the cataloger as part of this uh, project, um, working uh, along with Sam von Skayek. Um, and we were basically tasked with yeah, cataloging the tantric manuscripts. And it was really an incredibly fortunate three years where they were very generous and it allowed me complete free reign. And, uh, and, um, but luckily my interests overlap perfectly with what they wanted me to be doing. And, I read through the collection, um, and it was a particularly uh, nice experience because as I started to work on these manuscripts, I began to realize that a lot of the work that had been done on it so far had all been, that other scholars had been approaching the collection, which is a little overwhelming uh, by itself. They'd been approaching it through the gateway of the catalog of the Tibetan manuscripts at, in London, um, which had been done by Delevele Poussin. And, uh, and so I was able to, to just throw that aside and just start reading through the manuscripts one by one and as a result uh, found all sorts of new treasures. So, um, as I, uh, so as I, as I began working on all this material, I say this in the introduction, I, I, I began, I, I was so excited about some of the initial finds and I fired off a couple of articles and they were just, they're still out there, <laughs> I wish I could retract them. They were just loaded with mistakes. I just wasn't really fully qualified to make sense of this uh, collection yet. And, uh, and in a way I sort of stopped publishing and um, had to re-educate myself on the history, early history of Tantric Buddhism in India in order to be able to contextualize these manuscripts better. And uh, that's partly why this took me 20 years to gradually come around and be able to say something um, about what I discovered there. Um, so the book basically is, it, it's, it does several things all at once. It's, it's a study. Uh, it uses the Dunhuang manuscripts, the Tibetan tantric manuscripts from Dunhuang, as a kind of window into India and the development of tantric Buddhism in India. So Sanjo mentioned my Taming of the Demons and that was really my attempt to use those same manuscripts to understand the history of early Tibet and, and later. Um, but this was, yeah, like I say, I was trying to contextualize the collection in terms of what was happening in India. and. Um, 
which I'm only half qualified to do because I'm not really a Sanskritist. Uh, but uh, anyway, I went ahead and um, and so a lot of the book is just, despite what Sanjo said, is a lot of very technical details about the changes and de and uh, in tantric ritual and how it all developed over time and how it all worked internally as a system. Um, <clears throat> but there were two larger arguments. One was that ritual manuals, which is what I found myself reading there, was, were particularly important. So in a way it's a history of early tantric ritual manuals as a genre in particular, and the Dunhuang, uh, the ones preserved at Dunhuang even more particularly. And then the second point was uh, it's, I started to find, I started as, uh, partly out as a result of being here and uh, teaching in EALC and being friends with Paula and Alan and other people, I started being more and more interested in a kind of more literary, applying a more literary lens to some of these texts. So that's another kind of the second kind of idea that I had uh, more generally. Anyway, so... Oh yeah, so um, so this whole line of thinking began for me. A little bit, I'm going to do a little autobiogra autobiographical here. Um, in 2004, there was an exhibition at the British Library um, uh, that uh, uh, I was asked to write some of the entries in the catalog for, and um, and uh, and in the process of that, I was. This is one of the images or one of the manuscripts that they included and I was asked to write about it even though I don't read Chinese. So I spent some time thinking about this, got someone to read it for me. And uh, it's basically a picture of an altar, a diagram of an altar for the worship of Vishnishivijaya. And uh, so I started thinking, okay, well, where is this from? And I started reading the Ushnishivijaya, which is a Dharani Sutra, a Mahayana Sutra. And, uh, and I didn't really find anything in there that corresponded to what you see here. Um, but I started looking around further. I noticed there were actually a couple different versions with different ritual sections. They're, they're sort of separate vidi ritual sections. And I also started looking around and noticing that the Chinese versions have actually in the Taisho there are preserved still further standalone vidis, uh, ritual manuals for per performing these kind of rites. And, uh, and I just continued reading over the next few years and gradually determined that nothing really perfectly matched what's in this picture. Um, but as I was working on this entry, it, it sort of struck me as interesting that nothing matches. And I started to realize that actually there clearly are lots of different ritual manuals circulating around this Dharani Sutra. And Tibetan, the Tibetan canon preserves some of them. The Chinese canon preserves some others. This, this manuscript preserves a glimpse into yet another. And, uh, and so this was, this, as I was working on it, I started thinking, well, wait a minute. There's the Dharani Sutras, and there are these Vidhi sections that are sometimes circulating independently, sometimes appended to the end of the sutras, and, as, as, and sometimes you see them actually kind of interrupt the flow of the text. So it'll be going along in the sutra, and suddenly it'll say, oh, and regarding the Vidhi, and it'll go on about that, and then it'll even in the Tibetan say things like Dzogso, meaning the end, and then it'll re-enter into the sutra. So I gradually started to think, well, wait a minute, these ritual sections, these little manuals, are being appended, circulating independently, being inserted later into the sutras. And, uh, and so then, um, using uh, the Taisho again, I started looking at the history of these Dharani sutras. This is more later when I was at Yale. And, uh, and I started to realize that actually these, these, vid these manuals um, first appeared in connection to Dharani Sutras around the second half of the 5th century and just exploded onto the scene in the 6th century and 7th century. Um, and, uh, and I started then asking around to everyone I met and couldn't find any evidence of ritual manuals uh, in Buddhism before that. 
And so that struck me as, that was a kind of revolutionary moment where I realized, oh my God, this is a, a very important genre that includes not just vidis, but kalpas, sadhanas, all sorts of different ritual texts. But uh, in a way that this was so central to today's Buddhism, certainly in Tibet, and yet <coughs> there's a little evidence, evidence of this genre in early uh, Buddhism, and it seems to have emerged in connection to these Dharani Sutras. <coughs> so uh, I got very excited about that and uh, gave a couple talks on it. And then, as I mentioned, I, I wanted to learn more about, first of all, why? What happened in India that made this happen, that this, this major shift occur? Um, and uh, and so, so I, I, I basically became obsessed with the work of Phyllis Granoff and Koichi Shinohara. And thankfully, they hired me to work at Yale with them. And uh, so I was reading Chinese with Koichi and going through some of these Taisho texts, working on some of these conclusions that I just mentioned, and talking with them about the rise of image worship and all sorts of things. But I just couldn't believe that there wasn't some, like such a major shift couldn't be accompanied by other things that were happening more broadly in Indian religious culture. And I still don't know what that is. <laughs> but, um, you know, you get the rise of temple Hinduism, uh, stone temples, there are, there are various things, but, um, but uh, I was sort of eager to try and understand what, what was happening in India, and, and again, to sort of contextualize this. And um, one of the things that I was particularly interested in as a scholar of Tantric Buddhism was that uh, there's been a, something of a debate about whether Dharani Sutras are proto-Tantric or not, and that's something Michelle Strickman said. Uh, they were, and then other people, Bob Scharf and other people said, no, no, these are just Mahayana Sutras. And what I began to argue is actually, yes, I agree. Dharani Sutras are just Mahayana Sutras. They're not Tantric, although Chinese, Japanese, Tibetans all kind of say some of them are and some of them aren't. The whole tradition seems a little confused about the status of these Dharani Sutras. But, you know, in a way, sort of a sober scholar might say, it's better to say just they're not, they're Mahayana Sutras. So what I began to think was, well, maybe that's so, but I'll tell you what is proto-tantric is these vidis, these ritual texts that are circulating around. And that this, I started to then think of as a kind, this genre as a kind of petri dish in which um, people could sort of experiment and lots of innovation was sort of boiling and bubbling and, uh, and um, and it just, it was, a, it was a very human genre that allowed for localization of traditions, experimentation, and so on. So uh, I began to think about this as a genre more generally while I was at Yale. And, and one of the other thoughts I had was that uh, actually, sort of strangely, they were, it was such, it was actually a really important genre for the development of Buddhist ritual and eventually led to the first tantras, Buddhist tantras, which if you look at many of them, the very earliest Buddhist tantras, they are nothing but compilations of vidis. So um, I, I started thinking how this is really just leading into and allowing for the development of ritual and eventually the explosion of tantric Buddhism. Um, but what makes this, despite the importance, as I began to see it, of this genre, um, it, was, it was important precisely because of its unimportance, because it was extra canonical, because not Buddha Vachana, the word of the Buddha, these were just human authored, local, scrappy uh, manuscripts owned by people where they would insert their favorite prayers, write notes in the margins when they get teachings on them, and so on. So they, and still today, you can see this, uh, any Tibetan will, uh, who's doing any kind of practice will have the, sort of a collection of prayers, and it's a very idiosyncratic personal uh, collection. And in that sense, these ritual manuals really represent a kind of, um, a kind of interface between the canonical tradition and the individual, and provides a way for them to have their own texts written by their own teachers, amended by themselves. And uh, in that sense, it's precisely because this is such an unimportant, non-canonical, genre, that it's, that's exactly what makes it so flexible and open to innovation. And then when the person, the owner dies, unless they're an incredibly important teacher, for the most part, they're just scrapped. 
So then that m makes a, a further problem, which is that there's this incredibly important petri dish, literary petri dish of development that uh, is oh so human, and we have almost no evidence of its existence because they're not preserved, they're not worth preserving. And I began to then reflect uh, back on this Dunhuang collection and realized that not only are they valuable for their age, but also because, of, because they sort of preserve a time capsule of lived religion in the form of these ritual manuals. Um, and they give us a kind of glimpse into the development of early tantric ritual kind of between the tantras, between the canonical texts. Um, and, uh, and I even started to think that sometimes you get people experimenting and coming up with new practices, incorporating other ones, and eventually ritual a, a certain tradition of ritual manuals will grow to a point that it requires really a new canonical tantra to be written to re-encapsulate these developments in terms of Buddha Vachana. And they would write, they would either gather them together and put a thus have I heard at one time at the beginning of it, or sometimes they would write a more comprehensive kind of uh, text that would include some of these couched within more doctrinal terms. But in any case, we normally think of these ritual manuals as extractions from canonical texts. But early on, what you often see is the, the, the ritual texts are what is actually driving the canonical texts and sort of um, coming first before the, and, and then there starts to be a give and take. The canonical texts are shaping the ritual texts and then they're reshaping things and then a new canonical text has to be written. So again, what makes this Dunhuang collection interesting is it's kind of a, yeah, you see between, you get these glimpses between the tantras. All right, so that's where I was at in at Yale and this is like in 2005 to eight or nine, and then I came here. And uh, um, oh, I, I, sorry, I, I, I wanted to give you a sense of what one of these manuals, uh, the Tibetan canon, based. No, it's not based on this picture, but it's based on the Ushnisha Vijaya Dharani, so it's kind of a parallel text. Just to give you a feel for what this kind of, these kind of early manuals, pre-tantric Dharani-based manuals look like. They're really simple. And this one says, with cow dung that is gathered without it hitting the ground, you gotta catch it. Uh, you make a square mandala on the, on the ground, a little platform or something, and uh, scatter it with white flowers. Uh, place oil lamps with melted butter in the four corners, a little like this. These are butter lamps or oil lamps here and little pots of perfumed offerings. Adorn the flowers, uh, flowers, vessels with, filled with uh, water that has been similarly perfumed. In the center, place a stupa or a statue, where it says full, um, and uh, um, containing the heart dharani inside. Uh, and then, while touching it with your left hand and holding a rosary in one's right, recite this dharani, this spell, 21 times at, three, at the three times of day. And then if one drinks the offering waters that are on the altar in three sips from cupped hands, one will have no illness, one's life will be long, one's enemies will fade, one's intellect will be sharp and speech noble. If one sprinkles them around a barn or stables uh, or around a royal palace, there need be no fear of thieves, snakes, spirits, or demons, and there'll be no afflictions from any illness, and so on. You get the idea. So pretty straightforward. You're basically sort of empowering this water through the presence of the Buddha and the recitation of the spell. I read that exact passage at my job talk in 2008 in this room. Um, and uh, Paula was just saying, I hope this talk goes better than that one. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the kind of next chapter in the development of this book. Um, and so, let's see. So, oh yeah, so, okay, I'm, so I'm giving that talk and uh, basically I say more or less what I just said. And then Paula puts up her hand and says, excuse me, I have a question. And I, I said, what? And she said, well, we scholars of literature, when we use the word genre, we mean there are, we, we generally understand that to mean there are certain formal features that characterize that genre. So what is it that characterizes this genre? <laughs> oh my God. 
<laughs> I'm not trained as a literature scholar. And part of this book is me kind of partly realizing the extent to, uh, of my ignorance about uh, other ways of reading texts that are sort of more sensitive to the literary qualities of a text. Um, and that will begin with Paula's question, which uh, I came up with one or two things to say, um, but uh, which I'll mention in a minute. But uh, it was the beginning of me beginning uh, 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 of thinking about this genre in kind of a more literary form. So I think something along the lines of what I said at that point was, well, you've got the Mahayana Sutras, um, and uh, and they uh, there you have. You know, the Buddha, it's, just, it's the account of the Buddha teaching, often speaking to his audience. And if he's telling them what to do, it may be in the imperative case. Sometimes he's just describing the nature of the universe. Um, but when it is using the imperative tense, it is, um, it is, it all, all is kind of unfolding within the larger Nidana or framing narrative, which is well, once upon a time I was at uh, Vaishali and the Buddha was there, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so were there, and we asked this question, and he says this, and he says, do this, do that. Um, so it's all kind of framed within this larger story, and this kind of leads, the, leaves the reader, maybe, to imagine um, one's, the, oneself into the narrative. Um, but in a sense, it is a kind of journey into the past. And imagine you're at the feet of the Buddha and this is what he's saying to you. Or maybe, and since it's Mahayana Sutras, in some parallel universe, in some Buddha field. Uh, and you can imagine yourself into this distant world and imagine hearing this. Um, but it's not spoken kind of directly to you. You have to imagine yourself into this world. Ritual manuals, on the other hand, they are also written generally in the imperative or future tense and telling you what to do. Um, but these are different because they're speaking directly to the reader, which I think is actually a crucial difference. Um, and in that sense, it's telling you, you know, like we just read, uh, put an offering over here, hold your beads over there, do this, do that, put your hand here. Um, and uh, in this sense, it's really less of an invitation for you to imagine yourself into some distant world, but it's, it's the Buddha kind of, or it is, a, it is a kind of reaching out into our world, into the human world. And in that sense, it, that of course also relates to what I was saying about the unimportance of this genre and what a human genre it is. Um, but the sort of direction of uh, attention somehow is reversed. So I'll just read, I have a few little clips from my book here. So I end chapter two by saying, the sutras open a gap between their framing narratives and their doctrines between the past tense of the Buddha and the present tense of the Dharma, the person reading it, inviting the readers to kind of step in and inhabit this imaginary world of, of legendary teachings. And ritual manuals, like I just said, turn the tables, entering into the world of the reader. And sutras tell what happened in the past, manuals tell what should happen in the present. And if, if the sutras and Mahayana sutras still more focus on distant worlds, Dharani manuals re draw the readers into the immediate vicinity to their body and their bodily actions within a material ritual space like in that diagram. And then uh, what I began to then work, and this is all true of the ritual manuals of, associated with Dharani sutras, and then now we begin to move into Tantra. And tantric ritual manuals. And with the tantric rise of tantric ritual manuals, you see a new kind of revolutionary development, which is the imaginary worlds of the Buddhas kind of return and begin, it's, it's like this is no longer just a human realm separate from the Buddha realm, but now the Buddhas are kind of, you'll see what I mean, are kind of returning and beginning to suffuse the genre of ritual manuals and pervade the human with the divine. Um, the Buddha's perspective and his first-person voice returned, uh, but now the mythic and the human had been merged. So no longer is the Buddha just speaking out there or kind of absent. This is just your teacher telling you what to do. Now the Buddha is right. Is the, when you write a tantric ritual manual in some way, it's human authored, but it's also kind of Buddha authored. The line between who's a Buddha and who isn't a Buddha is becoming increasingly fuzzy with the rise of tantric Buddhism. And that's largely because you imagine yourself as a Buddha. And so when the 
the master writes, he's writing as a Buddha. Um, I'll, you'll, uh, I'll unpack this more. So now, the new, chapter three or whatever we're on. Um, <clears throat> then I got a semester at the Townsend Center for the Humanities, which um, I began to realize after I was sitting in this room week after week that the humanities uh, is basically, in that setting, literature scholars. Um, and then there was me. But I did say I wanted to learn how to take a more literary approach. And so then it came my time to present, and uh, I was completely stressed out because I didn't have anything to say. I'd been mostly looking at these Dharani ritual manuals. There's nothing literary. It's like driving a driver's manual, you know, like move this over there, do that, put your hand there, recite this this many times. It's, not, it's all written in prose. Like, um, Dharani sutras are terribly dull uh, kind of writing to read. Um, and I remember the night before, I was in my living room talking to my wife, Alice, and I was saying, you know, pacing back and forth, like, I've got to talk tomorrow, I don't know what I'm going to say. And, and then I was saying, there's really nothing literary about these. I said, you know, except like for these brief moments in these tantric manuals, like there's really just nothing. And I kept talking for five minutes, wringing my hands, and then at some point I said, well, there are those brief moments, and you don't see them in the Dharani ritual manuals, you only see them in the tantric ones. And actually, where those moments appear in the, in the manual are very crucial points in the ritual proceedings where suddenly the, the register switches to poetry and starts using metaphor and so on. And uh, that, again, was another turning point for me where I started to realize, oh, you can, but you can sort of track this and, 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 and use a literary lens to tell you things about what's important for a given manual. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples, which is what this book is full of, lots of examples. Um, so this is one tantric manual. In this case, it's a manual for performing an initiation, right? So in tantra, you have to be, it's all secret. You have to be initiated into a particular mandala, a particular ritual system, and then you can do the practices. So this is a manual for a teacher on how to perform a ritual, to, uh, to an initiation to initiate someone into the mandala. Um, and it's into the mandala specifically of this Sarvadurgati Parishodhana, or purification of all negative rebirths. So there's lots to say about all these manuscripts. I'm just going to zero in on a tiny little sliver of information. But um, basically, there are only two points. This whole thing's written in prose. There are two moments when you su it suddenly flips into poetry. Um, the first one is when a, a key moment where the mandala, if you've ever seen sand mandalas built in museums um, by Tibetan monks, that's done, but not in a museum. And, uh, and there's a point where the initiate is brought before it, blindfolded, and supposed to throw a flower, or some jewels, but usually a flower, onto the mandala and uh, blindfolded. And that somehow determines the initiate's karmic connection to a particular Buddha in the mandala. And those are then the practices that they'll do. So in that, this is this sort of almost prognostication car about the karma of the initiate. And at that moment, suddenly, for the first time, the initiate says something and says, all phenomena are naturally pure, so too am I naturally pure. Through the gathering of all the you know, oceans of conquerors, may I be united with the treasury body. These are actually both very famous little phrases. And then this mantra. And uh, the mandala is taught to be a wheel. That itself is taught to be the samaya. The deities who have entered the mandala, may they consecrate me. When the jewels, flowers, and so forth have established my principal family, I have no doubt that attainment will come. Right. So here the patron, meaning the initiate, prays for the Buddhas to empower the proceedings before they throw the flower, to accept them into his heart, uh, into their heart, uh, and to ensure that the flower they toss into the mandala immediately after this prayer lands appropriately and reveals the true nature of their karmic connections. It's a personal plea by a devotee to his deities. It is also entirely in seven syllable verse broken only by the mantra and as such is unusual within this mandala, this manual. The vast majority of which, like I said, is, already, is, is all written in prose. And uh, the verse also contains two sets of lines that appear, like I said, in other works, those first four lines. So that's also, in a way, 
marking the significance of this moment because these are sort of catch phrases like well-known prayers or uh, statements. Um, so this is just a very simple example of how it sort of marks the, the seriousness of the moment. Um, the, the only other moment it, it goes into uh, verse in this uh, manual is the actual moment of initiation. So this is a point where the initiations, like it says, are enacted by um, the, the, the officiating priest handing the patron a series of symbolic items, white mustard seeds, a mirror, dorva grass, bulva flower, uh, fruits, bezoar, yogurt, conch shell, and vermilion powder. And as the priest bestows each one, he recites a verse of nine, nine syllable lines emphasizing the moment's symbolic significance. So it doesn't sound that great in my translation, but sounds all right in Tibetan. This white mustard seed is the great supreme Vajra family. By means of this great gnosis of equanimity, free of concepts, here may there be, may there be supreme auspiciousness. And then the conch shell proclaims all the teachings by realizing the significance of the music of all the melodious teachings. Here may there be supreme auspiciousness. Red vermilion is the nature of power by gaining mastery over all life force. Here may there be supreme auspiciousness. So through these kind of poetic utterances, um, with each verse ending in the same rhythmic kind of refrain, uh, the master evokes in the, in the initia a sense of the ritual moment's import, uh, pointing to what is unfolding kind of at another level beyond that of the senses. Yes, I'm just handing you this, but actually what's happening is that. Um, and with each verse, the, the priest uses metaphor to link the object to this other, with the, to the nature of its sort of transformative power, um, and, uh, and also with what will be gained in the immediacy of this act. So anyway, this is an, another example of how this change in register to poetic verse um, is deployed to mark the significance of, of the event. So those are sort of simple examples. I mentioned before that with the rise of Yoga Tantra, which is sort of the beginning of Tantra proper, um, the line between human and Buddha starts to dissolve. And this actually has a, a huge uh, series of effects. So this is, I'll just read this. By the mid seventh century, another shift was beginning across all three traditions, uh, in large part meaning Hinduism, probably Jainism and Buddhism, in large part facilitated by the now widespread ritual manuals and their countless innovations. The tantras were starting to emerge at a rapid rate. This new genre of, these are canonical Buddha spoken texts. These tantras were starting to emerge at a rapid rate, new scriptures that evinced a sea change in Asian religious practice. And with them came an interlocking set of elements involving the inner world of the imagination. You saw it already a little in that, in that previous passage about the initiation and how there is the physical object and the imagined uh, event. Um, in the earlier Dharani-based rituals, the officiant would sit before an altar, which is actually termed a mandala, and direct their oblations to the, the incense and so on, to the Buddha at its center. Increasingly, the practice was accompanied or sometimes replaced outright by a completely new perspective now, an imagined level on which the practitioner is the Buddha, seated at the center of the mandala and receiving the offerings. So in effect, kind of metaphorically, with the rise of Tantra and Yoga Tantra, in a way, the practitioner ascends the platform, moves into the center of the mandala and imagines oneself at the middle as the Buddha. And when you're making offerings, you imagine yourself receiving them. Uh, when both the physical and the imagined levels of performance were retained, so sometimes you would just forget about the physical at this point and just imagine the whole thing, but sometimes you would continue to make offerings to an external mandala altar. And, and yet you're also imagining receiving them at the same time. And so when both of these levels, the physical and the imagined, were retained, the uh, practitioner might even arrange the prescribed offerings before the image in front of him while visualizing himself as that same Buddha receiving the offerings in a purified form from imagined offering goddesses. So tantric ritual in this sense unfolded on two registers, the outer on which was, which was visible to anyone present, and then the inner which remained invisible to most people. 
And it was on this inner level, the sort of secret level, that the real ritual was held to take place. It was on this imaginary level from this new perspective of the ritual subject at the center of the mandala, no longer just praying to some distant Buddha, but taking, being at the center of it all. It's on this imaginary level that the right true power was generated. The 8th century commentator Buddha Gupta explains uh, that the ritual master to draw a physical mandala, like with sand or whatever, upon the earthen platform, he should first imagine what he calls the intrinsically existent mandala in the space above the platform, like three feet of floating in the air, before, above the platform. Uh, and then only on the basis of this imagined true mandala can its reflection be drawn in paints and colored sands. So we see here a similar concept in, uh, I'll show you in a moment, uh, in two mandalas being depicted uh, with the physical and the imagined. Um, and uh, in this sense, the outward instructions of the, of the earlier Dharani manuals was kind of augmented with these detailed descriptions of what the practitioner could imagine. And in, and in this sense, note that the imagined one, then the imagination in general, is no sort of sad facsimile of reality, like there's the real and then there's this kind of pretend world of the imagined. No, here the imagined is the real, and you create the physical mandala on the basis of that. So the imagination, in this sense, is becoming increasingly the root of all phenomena. Um, and this gets into the emanations of universes and so on. Here's a nice Dunhuang uh, painting in the Guimet, where you have this beautiful Vajradhatu mandala, and then there's the mandala at an altar. And so you get these two forms of of, of what, what a mandala is, the, the real and the real are real. Um, okay, so then the book moves on to uh, that, that Yoga Tantra development is sort of 7th and uh, early 8th century and then by the mid, middle of the 8th century you get the beginning of even better yoga, the, the Maha Yoga um, Tantra. And, um, and, uh, and these texts focus even more on what is to be performed. Not, it's not, where Yoga Tantra was about becoming a Buddha ritually, this is more about, yes, you become a Buddha, but it spends much more time on what you then do as the Buddha. And this is where you get the infamous sex and violence of Tantric. Uh, religion, because when you're a Buddha, you don't make distinctions between what you should and shouldn't do, what is good and what is evil, and what is appropriate or inappropriate. So you practice breaking all sorts of social taboos in, in, in order to see the, the underlying non-duality of such things. So these kind of more transgressive uh, texts at Dunhuang only kind of, they basically as far as I've seen, all only date to the 10th century. Whereas you see Yoga Tantra stuff dating Tibetan materials in the 9th century, you only see these transgressive ones in the 10th. Now this is all coming from the 8th century in India. So what's going on there? I, could, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but basically what's happening is in the 8th century and, or, and first half of the 9th, the Tibetan Empire was madly translating and bringing in uh, Buddhist teachings and they prohibited the, uh, the circulation of these transgressive tantras. Um, and I would argue that that's why you see, yes, you see the Yoga Tantra materials circulating already in the 9th, but it's only after the empire collapses in the middle of the ninth and sort of gradually descends into chaos uh, through the ninth century that you begin to see these materials circulating more freely around Tibet. Um, so that's why you see these more transgressive texts all of this tenth century, sort of after the, the hand of the, of the law has retreated. All right. In these texts, when you generate yourself as a Buddha, you do it in three stages. And first, this is actually true in any tantric meditation even today, you meditate, you sort of do some kind of meditation to dissolve all this, 
and see it as empty, and you rest in the space of emptiness. You just meditate on that. The the, the thusness samadhi. And then, somehow, this, and then this emptiness kind of starts to uh, presence, or emerge, or become more vivid. And that's called the all-illuminating samadhi. And that then begins to take a form, which is the causal samadhi, where it actually first becomes a syllable, and then uh, a, a symbol, and then eventually a Buddha. And what I want to focus on is this moment of the all-illuminating samadhi. Remember how I said the, with this idea of the imagination coming before reality, this is tied to this idea of emanating worlds. And this is, in a way, a story of how you can reenact uh, the story of how uh, a Buddha appears in the world out of emptiness, how the Buddha emanates into the world to help beings and retracts. Um, so in effect, what you're doing is dissolving this samsaric reality and then re-emerging as a Buddha. And what's interesting for these authors was I, where you see the most sort of poetic imagery suddenly being loaded on is in this all-illuminating samadhi, this moment where it's, there's, it's after emptiness, but before anything is actually appearing. It's this kind of energization of emptiness or something. So here's one uh, that uses a series of similes that emphasize not just what should be cultivated, what should be imagined, but how is it to be generated, um, which is exactly what an interlinear note asks. And that the answer, the entirety of outer and inner appearances and existences are like a ripe amalaki fruit, I'll explain that, held in the palm of one's hand like seeing the luminous space of dawn emerging from the pitch darkness of an autumn sky. Or substances placed in a clean blue crystal bowl, viewed from the outside, they're illuminated from within, viewed from the inside, they're illuminated from without. So that's a weird set of three images. Here's Amalaki fruit, Myrobalan, which this is my reading. I would, how am I supposed to make sense of this? Um, uh, it says, the the, 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 it's like a ripe amalaki. These are often dried. But then a ripe amalaki fruit held in the palm of your hands, like seeing the luminous, uh, I, I would argue, it's about the fact that these are kind of like gooseberries, where they're sort of see-through. Um, and so maybe this is something about how you can see the outside and see within. This This sort of play of... Um, inside and outside of surface and depth, which again comes back with uh, uh, the breaking of dawn across a clear, dark sky, um, which is this moment when light almost seems to come from within the space itself, right? You, the sun has not yet risen, but somehow the light, the, the sky is starting to brighten. Um, and finally, the third image. Um, which maybe even kind of unites the previous two, where objects are resting within a dark kind of sky-like bowl. Um, so what I would say here is, the takeaway here is maybe that this all-illuminating samadhi is being portrayed as a kind of transitional moment, um, uh, which is a kind of luminous play of surface, surface and depth, and inside and outside not quite being separate yet. It's trying to present something like this. So here's another manuscript on the same moment, another Mahayoga text, and here you get more. So, like the surface of the sky, similar, but a little bit different image, the surface of the sky, as if it had a surface, appearance, only seeming to appear, is empty, only seeming to be empty, and luminous. Like a full moon reflected in water, gnosis pervades the depths of space without center or limits. So it is called the all-illuminating samadhi, the emptiness samadhi, the clear bliss of means, because it's going from just space to means to active action. The opening for form, the cause for forms to arise, like the surface of an empty sky or the reflected forms of the sun, the moon, planets, and stars appearing brightly on a clear lake with no reality nor characteristics, 
like an inwardly facing ritual mirror or a lake at dawn cultivating without wavering from the cu cultivate without wavering meaning meditate without wavering from this state of the great compassion so this passage starts right away with this this, this image of this, the surface of the sky a kind of meeting point between surface and depth i would argue and uh, and then linked to this is another interplay between appearance and emptiness um, uh, an experience that sort of eludes language and only seems to be unfolding and it seems to be empty, it seems to be appearing, but really nothing is happening. And then there comes this gnosis after the series of names, um, which is at once a mere, uh, a mere sort of surface reflection upon a shimmering water and a light that pervades the depths of a space that, that lacks any center or limits. Um, is this so it's this paradoxical kind of shift that's of both worlds, appearance and emptiness. A paradoxical shift out of sort of mere emptiness that is both the cause and the opening for forms to, to arise. Uh, um, a kind of implicit appearance um, that's still implicit. Uh, the reality of which is still elusive. Um, and it's, it's like mere reflections of distant stars or a mirror reflecting itself that's at once one and two emerging yet folded within itself um, so such we're told is is the nature of, of great compassion on the verge of appearing for all beings okay I should stop soon but I will just end by saying this is the manuscript that the whole book culminates in and it's I, my favorite from Dunhuang, it's entirely written in verse. And really many of these um, Mahayoga sadhanas, ritual texts are written now entirely in verse. Whereas you first start seeing verse being used at particular important moments, this spreads until everything is in verse. And like I say, the line between human and Buddha author text has sort of collapsed and the text is speaking Buddha and yet it's also still human because anybody can write these or someone who's qualified can write these. So, um, uh, so what I want to just read you is this very nice passage I just love. Um, this is where, okay, you've now generated yourself as a Buddha, and um, many ritual texts at this moment will go into huge detail, endless detail about what, how many bracelets you're wearing and what kind of silk and clothing, what you have kind of on, on trousers you're wearing, what, what the seat looks like and what color it is and this and that it just goes on and on to help you gradually build up this vivid visualization of what you look like as the Buddha. This one is much more, much brief, briefer and I would argue maybe more evocative. As if mindfulness, the vital breath and its restriction were speaking, speaking as if the earrings, necklace, and limbs were swaying, swaying, as if on the base the vajra and seed syllables at your heart are blaz were blazing, blazing. The vowels, it doesn't sound great in English, the vowels, the anusvaras, the, inter the dots between the syllables are so perfect. So I think these, I find these just providing a really exceptional example of poetic conjuring. Um, uh, it's in obviously it's it's in it's, it doesn't look great in English, but um, it's in nine syllable uh, verse, um, and it kind of is just flashing a series of um, three two syllable images each line at the reader, as if mindfulness, the vital breath, its restriction, we're speaking, speaking, and then this doubled exclamatory verb, speaking, speaking, um, and the final as if the as if that I begin with actually appears at the end. So you get the reality of the vision and then it's kind of undercut at the end. And this infuses the whole scene with a dreamlike quality, I think, um, reminding the reader that this is all mere perception. So, uh, and then only this final line lacks these doubled exclamations, blazing, blazing, swaying, swaying. Um, and, uh, um, and it lacks the as if, and sort of, I, I, would th I find it sort of providing a kind of sense of closure to the four lines um, through both form and content, so with its last words, so perfect. Um, so wh what I find 
what, what I find kind of uh, interesting to think about with this is that these images are kind of flashing and layering, very much movement, uh, uh, images of movement and energy and light. But nowhere, notice, is the deity itself described, right? It's, it's, it's very much present. In fact, I would argue it's already present. And perhaps even its solidity, its existence, lies precisely in this givenness, this presumed already present uh, uh, quality. Um, and the poetry really exploits also the changeability of thought, uh, working at this kind of evanescent surface of the imagination to seduce the reader's uh, attentions with all these movements of the deity's speech and body and mind. Um, and yet precisely in doing this, in sort of seducing our, our fleeting attention, um, the verse draws the reader into its underlying imaginal reality um, because these are the expressions, after all, of someone who's wearing these, these necklaces. The adornments are on someone. The blazings are within someone, but they never mention who. And so even as the imagery kind of draws our attention to the surface, it assumes this underlying depth and this presence of the deity itself. Um, so I think I'm out of time. I just want to mention why I used that image. Um, as at the beginning uh, and on the ad for this talk. This is uh, Dinga Kensei Rinpoche and, and uh, the Dalai Lama exchanging teachings. And um, I don't know how far to push this whole argument. What I tried to do is really limit it to ritual manuals, like the developments that are happening within ritual manuals, but it's tempting to think that this culminates a little later after the texts that are preserved at Dunhuang in the moment of, in Tantric Buddhism, the fourth initiation, or in Dzogchen Ngotra, the, the introduction to the state of your mind, or this idea of where, uh, who is it, Talopa slaps Naropa with a fish. These kind of, and, and it sounds very Chan or Zen-esque as well, but this idea of using poetic kind of aphorisms to just immediately transmit a, a, a sort of um, either awakening or some sort of aesthetic sublime moment or something uh, from teacher to disciple. Um, and so uh, this, by the end of the 8th century, is exactly what's starting to take over all over Tantric Buddhism and grows to become kind of the be-all and end-all experience um, of that, that, that is passed down through a Tantric lineage. And I would, uh, I would suggest that maybe it, it was made possible by the developments within the genre of ritual manuals that this was a moment when the ritual kind of transmission of poetic experience um, sort of reached its, its culmination historically. Okay, 